Great. Welcome back, everybody, to conversation number 45. We're again talking with Dr. Ellie Fite, and today she's going to share with us her ideas around profit maximizing A-B testing, um, which is a test and rule, I'm assuming Bayesian method um, of um, both estimating and making some decisions a little bit faster with a, little, a lot less data in many cases. Um, if you didn't get the chance to hear from Dr. Ellie Fight last time, um, she's from Drexel University. Uh, she's a Bayesian statistician with a PhD in marketing from the University of Michigan. Uh, she teaches data-driven digital marketing and marketing experiments at Drexel. And if there are any professors out there, we'd love for you to learn from Ellie and start doing more A-B testing for businesses in your marketing and business classes so that we can hire those students uh, with a more knowledge of practical world business stuff like Ellie does. It's, it's really quite impressive. Um, and she does this teaching by making technical material approachable and accessible. As you can see here, I have an um, uh, is.gd link. Uh, so it's just is.gd forward slash test and roll. And this will lead you to the uh, a really great um, Twitter thread that Ellie wrote up that kind of explains some of this concept. So I encourage all of you to, to read it, share it. Um, and uh, if you have questions, I'm sure um, you can engage with Ellie there and of course on the TLC Slack channel. So thank you very much, Ellie. I will stop share and um, I will let you take over. Here we go. And of course, Zoom rearranges all the windows in a seemingly or random you way. Share, you're like, ah. <laughs> let me rearrange everything. All right. Um, I'm not following the uh, TLC um, Slack. So if there's it. something that you want me to address from over there, just let me know, Kelly. Absolutely. All right. So we're going to talk about um, a project I've been working on for a couple of years. Actually, Dylan heard a sort of early sort of, you know, brain dump of this project. Um, but it's, it's now more or less done, and I'm excited to talk to you guys about it today. Um, this is essentially the less technical version of the Twitter thread that Kelly showed you. So if you want the more technical version, head to the, the Twitter thread. Um, all right, so this was all motivated by um, the typical uh, A-B test setup screen that you are confronted when you do an email test. So lots, all the email A-B testing tools have a screen that looks something like this. We'll send version A and B to a random sample of recipients and then send the winning version to everyone else. And then you're confronted with this slider and you're like, oh, should I make the test a little bit smaller? And then I get to send the winning version to more people or should I make my test bigger? And then I get to send the winning version to smaller people, to fewer people. And we call this kind of a test, a test and roll, because we're not just testing, we're testing and then we're going to do something based on the results of the test we're gonna roll. Um, so the second, you know, the gray bar here is the visual representation of the roll phase, or sometimes I'll call it the deploy phase. So there's the test phase and the deploy phase. And you might think this only applies to email, um, but it in concept applies to websites too, because you're going to run to, you know, an A-B test on your website, and then you're going to choose one of those versions and, and deploy it maybe for say a quarter until the next refresh that you do on that page. Or maybe it's years that that page is going to stay the way it's going to be, but whatever that time frame is would be your deploy phase. So um, the question you're confronted with here is, how should I set that slider, right? What, what exactly should the number of people that I send it to A and B? So just putting a little bit of math notation on it. Um, the problem that we're facing is to choose N, what I'm gonna call N1 star and N2 star to send the treatments to. Then we're gonna collect data on the response and then we're gonna roll, which means we're going to choose a treatment to deploy to the remaining capital N minus N1 minus N2. Now, in some cases, N capital N is a little fuzzy exactly what it is, but for, you know, for our purposes here today, let's just imagine there is a total number of customers. There is a total um, expected amount of traffic that I'm going to get at my website after deploy. There is a total expected number of email addresses that I can send the winning version to. Um, and it turns out this is a Bayesian decision problem. So, um, 
those of you who aren't familiar with it, you can read really, you know, tediously mathematical textbooks about it. But the idea is that we're actually going to make a decision that maximizes the profits that we're going to earn. So that's why we call the paper profit maximizing AB testing. We're going to make a decision about N1 and N2 in a principled way based on profit. In order to get traction on that problem, I actually need to know a little bit something about how the treatments work. Um, you basically cannot get any traction on the problem without making some kind of statement about what is the range of differences I am likely to see between A and B. But this group here, we've been squirreling away data on tests for years and years now. So we can use that data to kind of inform what is the range of differences that I'm likely to see between A and B. Um, and so for most of the rest of the presentation, I'm going to use an example based on two, uh, about 2000 website A-B tests that were run by a number of different um, testing groups on a large software platform that facilitates website A-B testing. So you can plug in your name of your favorite website A-B testing tool in there. They actually took all of the tests that they had facilitated through their software and gave us that those 2000 tests. And what's plotted here is the lift that we see in those tests between A and B. And it's kind of symmetric, meaning what people label A and what people label B seems to flip like one, sometimes A is better, sometimes B is better, um, but we're seeing lifts kind of in the range of 50% um, down to 50% up. Uh, so taking that data, um, I can tell you that the average conversion rate among all those previous tests, oh, you guys probably care. Um, conversion here is defined as clicking to the next page. So in, in order to kind of look at these 2000 tests in a way that's kind of similar across all of them, we're just going to say the conversion rate for all of these tests is clicking to the next page. So the, the click-through rate across all these tests averages about 0.68 with a standard deviation of 0.03 across all the different treatments in all of these tests. Um, so the, those old test results you've been squirreling away can kind of give you some information about the range of differences you're likely to see. Um, I have a student who uh, is working at a startup company and has every single newsletter that they've ever run, and they always run an A-B test on the subject line every time they, they send out that newsletter. So he took the collection of a couple hundred of those that he had and used it to, to start his process. I'm just using this as an example. You could plug in your own data. Maybe you're a much better tester than these people in these 2000 tests and you find treatments that are just through the roof in lifts. Um, but this is what we kind of typically see. I'm just, I just wanted to ask kind of the group, does this feel about right that most AB tests show no result? They're kind of there in the middle with just a few winners on the tails, you know, winners and losers. That, yep, that's what Dylan's typically see. So we're going to start with that. All right. Now, once I have that, that information from those old tests that I've been squirreling away, I can actually compute my expected profit from the test and roll. So I'm going, I'm looking at all the profit, all the conversions I get in the test stage, plus all the conversions I get in the roll stage. Um, and uh, I can actually compute that expected profit as a function of my test size. So here's a graph of that. I won't show you the equation. It's in the paper. It's got lots of Greek letters. It's fantastic. But um, if you're not into Greek letters, here's the graphical version of that. So as the test gets bigger, my total expected conversions goes up, up, up through the roof. We should all be very happy here in this group because what, what does that mean? It means that even small tests make substantial gains in our decision making. Um, so these are the smaller tests. Some of these tests, we actually, you know, we lose some profit because the test is too small and we're deploying the loser. Um, so that's why it's not as, as optimal as it could be. But up here is the, the peak point, which is 2,284 in this, this example. Um, and then it falls off kind of more slowly on the back end. So tests that are a little bit too oversized, it, 
it's better to run an oversized test than an undersized test is what this graph is saying. Cause it's like, it, you fall off a cliff to the left, but you kind of go down a gentle slope to the right. And so that means you want to run a test that's a little bit too big uh, rather than a test that's a little bit too small. Um, so that is, uh, you know, our expected profit. Um, and I can actually write, let me just back up this curve. I told you I wasn't going to show you the equation, but I am going to show you the equation because it's so cool. Um, so here's the equation. You just plug in um, the this. Let's see. So I won't tell you what all the numbers are, but that's the formula. Let's talk about the uh, the more important things. Oh, by the way, when we worked out this formula, uh, me and my co-author, Ron Berman, I was super excited because my daughter was taking calculus. And as part of this formula, I actually did the trick where you take the derivative and set it equal to zero. And that is the optimum. So I did all that. And then I could take it to her and she wants to be a scientist. And I was like, math is the language of science. You should learn this. And she was totally unimpressed. Uh, but hopefully you're a little bit more impressed than I am um, or than she was uh, by this formula. Here's some important sort of things we can take away from sort of staring at this formula for a while. First of all, if you have noisier data, you should have a larger test. We knew that, right? The more the noisier your response is going to be, you're going to need, it's like the signal to noise argument. We need uh, more signal, more test if we have noisy data. The second thing is that there, if you have a larger population, so if you're a bigger, you have a bigger email list or you have more traffic at your website, you should run a larger test. That's new, right? It's, people don't talk about that too much. That's kind of a new thing. Um, and then the third thing is, so sigma is a measure of what is the range of differences you typically see between A and B. Do you typically see very big differences, very small differences? So when sigma is bigger, that means A and B are more different than one another, and you should probably run a smaller test. Does that make sense? So the idea is if A and B are really different and I'm trying to figure out which one to deploy, I don't need much data because I'm gonna see right away. If A and A is just way outperforming B, then when I run a small test, I will see that I'll see very quickly that A is performing better and I'll deploy A and then I'll make all that profit. So this is the point where I expect people to start screaming because I thought I learned a sample size formula in my stats class like two decades ago, or I, maybe I relearned it uh, 10 years ago or maybe I just learned it, but there's another sample size formula and it looks nothing like that formula that I showed you before. Um, this might be, this is the formula that you probably learned in your stats class. Remember it has those Z things that the, the very old people among us had to look up in the back of the book, the stats book. We had to look up those Z scores and um, it has the same S, which is the noise in the data but it doesn't have the capital N. This sample size formula does not vary. This, this one, this is, we're gonna call this the hypothesis testing sample size formula, because that's where it comes from. It comes from this idea of we're doing this statistical hypothesis test that we want to have alpha type one error and beta type two, remember all this stuff, right? Um, I didn't talk about any of that to develop my formula. My formula is the profit maximizing formula. This formula is the sample size formula for a hypothesis test. And so it doesn't have capital N in it. It basically says your test should always be the same size. Whether you have an email list of 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, it doesn't matter. You should run the same size test. And um, the second thing that's kind of interesting about it, I'll just flip a second. The, the main part of the S's in here are squared and then square rooted, which means it grows with S as a line. Here the S is just squared, so it grows as a square, which is a lot faster. So basically this formula um, recommends much, much larger sample sizes 
as the data gets noisy. And if you don't like looking at equations as much as I do, let's just look at a picture of it. So here I've plotted the required sample size from a hypothesis test. That's the dotted red line that's a little faint there. That's the, that's the old school sample size formula that you learned. And this is my new formula, the black line, as a function of how noisy the data is. And if the data is not very noisy, it actually doesn't matter which one you use. They basically say about the same test size. But as the data starts to get noisy, the hypothesis test sample size formula goes through the roof. Well, not through the roof. It's not an exponential. That would really be through the roof. Um, it's a square, but it gets much, much, much bigger than the sample size um, that we're recommending that's profit maximizing. Um, and so this gets back to the tweet in the tweet I say, you know, have you ever computed the sample size formula and it was bigger than you could ever get? This sample size formula is recommending much, much smaller sample sizes. Um, so, you know, you might, you might be looking at this going, well, I learned that other one in a textbook and I tend to trust that the people who publish textbooks kind of know what you're doing. And at a very surface level, this, this crazy woman from Philadelphia is telling me that I should use a totally different formula that she invented. And why, you know, why should I believe her? So let me try to kind of, you know, open up that box a little bit. Um, the traditional hypothesis testing formula is designed for science, I would argue. And in science, we want to know which treatment is better. And we don't explicitly consider the cost of the test itself. So we actually don't care about, um, you know, how, say we're testing a new vaccine. We don't care how many people get saved from death during the trial. That's totally irrelevant. Um, we don't, care how many people get killed as a result of the trial because they weren't given the vaccine. That's also irrelevant. Um, what we really want to know is for all time, which treatment is better? Is it better to have the vaccine or to not have the vaccine? And so we use these very, very large sample sizes to make sure we have like truth for all time before we publish it in a paper and everybody believes it everywhere. And in the problem that I set up at the beginning of this talk, the email test, like you're going to test two subject lines on your next email. You don't need a report that says for all time that having an emoji in December of 2020 was better than not having an emoji, right? You just need to know which one to send to the rest of, to the winning part of the population. And you're not trying to develop learnings that can be used anytime beyond that initial test. Um, so, you know, we just wanna pick the treatment right now that's gonna maximize the profit. And we are actually going to consider the cost of the test. And there's an opportunity cost of the test because if one treatment is better or worse, by definition, the test is giving the wrong treatment to some people. And we're gonna actually explicitly account for that. Um, funny story. So I had kind of like worked through the math on this. Um, I had this idea that, that I just wanted to start over and figure out the profit maximizing sample size. And I, I was working on that problem. And then Ron said, someone must have done this before. And I was like, I don't know, but I started, you know, searching and I found that someone had done it before a guy with the last name, Barry, who was looking at clinical trials specifically for vaccines, but he was looking at a very particular case. He was not saying, should we give the, the mRNA vaccines to everybody in the planet? Um, he was looking at, should we give, I think it was a measles vaccine to people who were Native American. So his capital N, his total population was kind of limited. And it was like, should these Native American children get it? And there was some concern about a side effect that might be more severe for Native American children. So he basically came up with the same idea of test and roll within that population of people. And we could kind of debate the morality of that situation. Um, I'm not sure if that's a great idea to do in clinical practice or not. 
Um, but for marketing, it certainly seems sensible to me. Uh, like there's no, there's no uh, moral issue with sending the wrong subject line to some people, or, you know, unless it's a really offensive subject line. Anyway, um, so um, one of the things that's happening here in the test and roll is that we are we can actually compute the error rate. So um, in the role stage, I'm going to assume you're going to you're going to deploy the winner. You're not even going to compute a confidence interval anymore. You'd like you just throw that out. That's not that's the hypothesis testing thing that goes away. I'm just going to compute the average winner and roll that. That's my deployment, whatever one had the higher average. So when I run a really small test, sometimes I'm going to pick the wrong one. Like for instance, if I run a test size of zero, then I'm going to have to pick randomly between A and B and I'm going to have a 50% error rate, right? Half the time I'm going to pick the wrong one. And then as I run a bigger and bigger test, that error rate goes down. And so the error rate at the optimal, the profit maximizing sample size is about 10%. That is no longer an input. That's an output of the sample size formula. It says that is the optimal error. That's the best trade-off between um, how big you make the test, where you're by definition giving some people the wrong thing, and how, um, how, what is the risk that you deploy the wrong treatment. Um, and so this is like literally a calculated risk that maximizes profit. Like we calculated what was the optimal risk. And the optimal risk here is 10%. Now, you know what the optimal error rate is for a hypothesis test? Well, not optimal, but the standard error rate is for a hypothesis test, it's 5%. And if we were to push down to you know, this larger sample size, this is actually the, the hypothesis test. You can see that the, the this is the recommended sample size for the hypothesis test. And if you read across, it gets you the 5%, because that's, that's the standard hypothesis test. But there's nothing magical about that 5%. So if you always thought, like, why should my error rate be 5%, five this is an answer to that sort of puzzle. Like, you shouldn't always be using 5%. You should use the percentage that makes sense given your costs and potential profits. All right, so this is the busy slide. I apologize for it. Um, it, this table comes straight out of the paper. So let me walk you into it. Um, so I wrote this paper where I was trying to argue that it's a good idea to use this sample size if you have a test and roll kind of situation. And so I took the test and roll and I compared it to other things you might do. So the test and roll says run 2,200 people roughly in each group. And the hypothesis test says run 18,000 people and change in each group. And I actually computed how many expected conversions would you get if you did that. And uh, the approach I'm proposing gets 69,500 and, you know, 69,536 conversions. The hypothesis test gets basically 500 fewer conversions. So it's better. It's not like, you know, you know, don't, you're not going to double your profits kind of better, but it's definitely better. And it's a much smaller test. Um, there's a couple other things, rows here that I put in because people sort of asked. So at the far end here, I have like do a no test. Just if you roll one at random, um, then you would get 68,000, right? You're Even if you didn't do any test, you'd actually make quite a bit of money because you know, the treatments that we come up with marketer as marketers are not like horrible, horrible. Optimization is about finding better than okay, right? So this is the okay. Um, this one at the far end is perfect information is, um, it's just like a, a an ideal that we could never achieve, which is what if um, someone omniscient just told us which one to deploy? This is like the perfect hippo, <laughs> solution. Like they, they literally know which one is the better one. And that would get you about, um, 150 more conversions if you were omniscient. Um, this one here is kind of interesting. So some of you may have heard of multi-arm bandits. So multi-arm bandits are, um, these testing algorithms that are sometimes called adaptive learning, where instead of setting a test and then a deployment, what you do is 
you run like 10 and then based on that, you adjust from 50, 50 to maybe 45, um, 55, and then you collect more data and you kind of slowly shift the proportion that are getting one treatment versus the other. So it kind of like takes something that happens like distinctly all at one point in time and shifts it more slowly. And in theory, it should be able to do better than the test and roll because the test and roll is more limited. It's like you have to test and then you have to roll. Um, and we were kind of surprised uh, that, so that fancy machine learning method only does about 5% better. So, and actually when I, I sent this paper to someone at Warby Parker and they were like, oh, we love this paper because we had a bandit on our site and it was terrible to maintain because the, that machine learning algorithm has to interact with the website. We never really know what treatment people are getting. Um, there's no one point where we made a decision. And so we like the idea that we could make a decision. So we actually like seeing like, oh, we're not leaving that much cash on the table compared to all the engineer time that it took to do the fancy Thompson sampling. We kind of like this simpler thing. So um, let's see, what else do I have? Oh, yes. So. Don't look at the slide. I'm going to make it take it away so you can't look at it. Um, one last thing. Do any of you do media tests? So where you're doing like some kind of media, like send the email versus don't send the email or show the ad versus don't show the ad. So what is your typical split between the ad and no ad? Do you do those 50-50? When you're doing the split test between ad and no ad, what do you typically do? It depends heavily on how you're running it because oftentimes you don't have the control um, and of, of mm -hmm. the splits because like you're doing it through Google or whatever, or in some circumstances um, you like, we try to not go dark anywhere. So we don't do true controls. We'd use blocking. Um, but let's see, John says, is this intended for only control and test comparison, not three or more? It, I don't, I don't think that's about the, um, ads directly, but. So the math could, can be extended to more there's, um, so I'm only talking about two because I don't get the closed form formula for three. I have to write a little computer program to solve what is the optimal sample size for three or more. So I. Yeah, I do, uh, it, you can definitely do it. And actually, this is kind of interesting, Thompson sampling's advantage gets bigger when you start to have a lot of treatments, like 10 or 15, because Thompson sampling will get you quickly to mostly running the best ones, like the best two or three, whereas the test and roll, you, you run a higher and higher risk of picking like the second best or the third best. You're not going to pick clunker, but you're not going to pick the best one either. And the, so the Thompson sampling starts to have a bigger advantage. And there's some very pretty plots in the, um, there's plots with like uh, density plots of overlaid of transparent colors in the Twitter thread that show that difference between the Thompson sampling and the test and roll. Um, okay, but getting back to my question, in these media tests, every media test I've ever <laughs> analyzed or been involved in, like, well, occasionally you see 50-50 splits, but 5% or 10% of holdout is more common in those kind of media versus no media tests. And I actually had someone come to me once and say, oh, we're planning holdouts on all our catalog campaigns and we can't decide if it should be 5% or 10%. And I was like looking through textbooks going, there's nothing in the textbook that talks about this. There's literally, you know, that traditional sample size formula always tells you to do a 50-50 split because a 50-50 split maximizes statistical power. But if you are trying to maximize profit and you believe that one treatment is better than another treatment, then you should do more of the better treatment in the test, which is the intuition behind why people do five or 10% holdouts in media tests. So um, I took some data from a catalog campaign. And so these were catalog holdout tests. And I took all the prior catalog tests and analyzed them. And sadly, on average, the catalog does not increase sales. It actually depresses sales a little bit. Some of these catalogs are really bad. And I think 
it's not that they're bad. I think what happens is it's a, it's a retailer who changes out their product every month and the catalog can, um, serve to kind of give the, the customer the information that she doesn't like what's on sale this season. It's a clothing retailer. And so then she doesn't go to the store and then she doesn't happen to find something else that she wants to buy. And so I think the catalogs, anyway, the catalogs are kind of bad in this case. And when you run the test and roll, it tells you that it's optimal to only send the catalog to 588 people to run this mini test, basically like this is a push in test instead of a hold out test, like just run a few of the catalogs and compare it to some other people. And then you'll, you'll see um, whether or not this particular catalog, maybe it's a good season and the catalog draws people in and it actually, you should deploy the catalog to everybody. Um, so, uh, it's sort of a backward situation, but the, you know, stepping back from this specific table, the cool thing about this is we can actually come up with an informed, uh, prediction about, um, how many should be in treatment and control when you think the treatment is good. Like when you, when you have basically prior data that tells you, yeah, usually when we send an email, it lifts sales. So we want to send, you know, what we want to do is basically send the email to more people and, um, hold out fewer people. Um, all right. So, uh, I'll skip this because we talked about the, I just put a copy of the, the Twitter thread. Um, that's where you should go if you want like, um, a sort of fast, but more technical version of this. Um, so, but just to, to wrap up this conversation, cause I'm excited to get to your questions or, you know, what you guys think about it. Um, so why should you do a test and roll? Well, you should do a test and roll when you're in a situation where the information that you're going to get in the test is going to be useful kind of to make one decision. And then we're going to move on. Um, things like what should the hero image be on the homepage for the next quarter? <laughs> like I'm going to do that and then I'm going to move on. And it's not like, I'm not trying to get some more generalized learnings. Like it's better to have a female hero than a male hero. Um, so if you're in a situation like that, you should use this sample size formula because it'll give you smaller sample sizes, especially when you have a noisy response, um, relative to the, the old school sample size formula it will give you a sample size that scales with the population. So it will tell you if you have a bigger population, you should run a bigger test, which is sort of intuitively nice. Like our clients always kind of feel that. And then we say, oh, no, 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 that's not true. In this case, it is, it is true. Um, the analysis is straightforward. We don't do confidence intervals anymore. We just pick the winner because that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to make the deployment decision. So we don't need this like sort of inferential waypoint between the data and the decision. And then um, we have this nice feature that these unequal group sizes are rationalized, um, which is useful for media holdout tests. It's also useful for discount tests where we have a, some prior beliefs about how the discount is gonna work. Um, so that's it for the test and roll. Like I said, I'd like to get to your questions. Just a few, few ads since I might not have time at the end. Um, I have two other papers about marketing experiments. One, um, we actually take multiple holdout experiments and pull them together, which allows us to get email and catalog responsiveness for each customer, which we can use going forward in targeting. Like we can say this customer is really catalog responsive, but not email responsive and vice versa. So that we're sending the emails to the people who respond to emails and the catalogs to the people who respond to catalogs. It's hugely lifts uh, the profit from targeting over traditional like RFM type targeting. Um, and then the other paper I'm working on right now, I actually paused writing code for it uh, in order to come uh, talk to you guys. Um, but it's about increasing the power for experiments where the response is a number with many zeros, like sales per customer. I'm sure you've never seen data like that. I'm being sarcastic. I'm sure lots of people have seen data where your response, your main Y variable is a number like sales per customer. It's you know, it's often non-zero, but it's often zero as well. Mm -hmm. um, two other things. I have a bunch of uh, tutorials that are typically in R that you might be interested in, especially this first one here. It's So this is on my website um, and there's a, a GitHub repo and you can like download all the code and it teaches you how to do a whole bunch of A-B testing related stuff in R like uplift modeling and 
um, blocking and matching and a bunch of like kind of cool advanced stuff. And then um, uh, Tim had mentioned as we were getting started, I also have um, two books now, uh, R for Marketing Research and Analytics and Python for Marketing Research and Analytics that show you how to do stuff like segmentation using R or Python. Um, these two books don't cover A-B testing, but they have lots of stuff that marketing people would be interested in. So um, I guess I'll go back to this slide and just open it up for like, what, you know, what are people thinking? I'm, I'm curious about the reaction. Well, I have a series of questions that have been asked over in the calls channel. So um, if, with your permission, I'll start asking those first. Sure. Um, so Merritt asked, do you have a rule of thumb you recommend for calculating in with regards to website traffic? So capital N, obviously. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's just going to be like your future traffic. So if, if you, and you, you know, you'd want to look at that seasonally, if it's a seasonal, if it has seasonal traffic. So you'd want to look at, I plan to, you know, deploy this feature for the next three months, which is October, November, December. So I'm going to look at October, November, December last year as my, you know, the number of visitors in that period as my N. Um, but yeah, no, no magic formula for that, but that's what I'd recommend. All right. Nate, I see you're off mute. Do you have a question or you just off mute? Okay. I'll mute you. You're good. Um, the next two questions are kind of related, especially to your answer in regard to seasonality. So um, how sensitive are outcomes to your priors being accurate? Being, I didn't catch that, Kelly. How sensitive are your outcomes to the priors accuracy? So the prior is pretty vital. And actually the sample size will depend a lot on the prior. So um, that's probably one of the biggest criticisms that you could have of this is that it's extremely like all Bayesian methods. They have some sensitivity to the priors. Um, my argument is that, you know, in business we have priors, so why wouldn't we use them to improve profits? But you're right. right if, if they're not actually your priors, then, um, or if your priors are inaccurate because say everything's changed over the, you know, COVID year that. That was. Yeah. It, yes, exactly. So one of the things, um, I think we even mentioned this in the paper is you might want to blow up your priors a little bit, just like push it out and, um, it, you know, to make an adjustment to, to account for that, you know, I, when I say priors, priors are not based on past data. Priors are what you truly believe about the future. So you're allowed to adjust those. If you think the past data has some difference from the future. Allowed to and encouraged to adjust them based on what you believe, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that would be, yeah. Um, oh, oh, one thing I, uh, that I'm sorry, I'm hesitating. So there was something kind of in the call stack. Um, don't forget that when you compute sample size with the hypothesis testing formula, you also have priors uh, in the form of this D so this D in the bottom of the formula is the difference that you want to detect, which embeds your prior belief about what different would be important to detect. And um, it's very closely related in my formula to this sigma of what kind of things are out there that I, I might want to detect. The main difference is instead of me requiring you to come up with that D, what the hell should this D be? Um, I, instead I just say, tell me, you know, what profit you're going to make and, and what range of treatments you have. And I'll tell you, I'll back into that for you basically. So, um, so that's, you know, you, you may not realize it, but when you use this sample size formula, you have priors too. In fact, all experimental planning requires some sort of prior. Um, so it's one of the reasons why people who are interested in experiments ought to consider Bayesian methods because planning an experiment requires priors. For sure. Um, Merit has another question and I, it, I guess, I guess it's relevant to both formulas. So your, your small S in your formulas is the average standard deviation of baseline conversion rate. Is that accurate? Yes. So it would be P times one minus P if it's a conversion rate, but we wrote it as S because we have cases where the response is something else like sales or time on site that isn't a conversion rate. 
and uh, sigma is the average effect in the average effect size. It's the variance of the effect size. The variance of the effect size. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's it's how so this is a plot of the lift in mm -hmm. the previous experiments. So these ex the, I'm actually taking this was the A that was tested against this B. This mm -hmm. is the difference, and I'm plotting that. It's how spready is this curve. If this curve is really spready, like there's lots of things that have really big lifts in one direction or the other, then I should run a smaller test. If this Important. curve is all bunched up, then I should run a bigger test. Important statistical term, spready. Yeah, sorry. Like if this spready. curve has high I variance. Love it. <laughs> sorry fantastic. no don't change it my goodness everybody gets it that's the whole point right um uh, christian asks does when you start the test matter given seasonality and base fluctuation so i haven't thought about this seasonality as much as i probably should have um your priors should probably bake in the seasonality That's that's my answer. I should bake in the season now. So if you think so you should that consider the, the fact you're like adjusting what you expect to happen based on what you expect from the season. Yes, yeah. And so if I was a retailer that had a holiday season, I would make, base my priors based on prior tests run during holiday. Right. Like I know that the effect sizes on say media holdouts go way down um when you're not in holiday like lots of things that work during holiday don't work at other times of the year right for sure uh mckinsey asks this will probably be an entirely different discussion but if i have someone who's set on a b testing prices and the product's price has always been the same can't quite look at price to sales relationship would you recommend using this style of a b test it's funny you bring that up. So last summer during the middle of COVID, Ron and I started working with a small Israeli firm that was trying to set prices. And we were actually working on a totally different approach. Um, like it, it's the same basic idea of having priors, but the thing about prices is I know that the demand curve is supposed to have a certain shape. Like, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's supposed to go down, right? When I raise the prices, it shouldn't go up. Yeah, and so, yeah. so you can actually bring that into part of the, you know, part of the model so that you can strain it to do that. So we were using uh, what's called a Gaussian process, which is a way of, um, we were using a method called Krieging, which is also a Bayesian decision theory <laughs> method, which says what I want to do is find like the next best point that uh, does a good trade off between how much I know about that point. Like mm -hmm. if the price is 15, do I know a lot or a little? And it says if it's far from other prices I've ever tried, then I know very so little, very little. Right. And I want to trade off kind of my best guess of how much profit I will make there with uncertainty um, versus uh, you know, like I also get to learn there. So it, it sets up the same trade-off between how much I learn versus how much I make. Uh, that was all very random, ram rambly. I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared, Mackenzie, for that one. Uh, but you can, I wouldn't do exactly this for price to answer, to get back to your original question, but I would do something like, you could do something like this. There are approaches where you say, I want to test, um, you know, I know it's safer to test closer to other prices and it actually help you decide what price should I test here. We're not talking, we're assuming the treatments are fixed. We've got a and B in the case you're talking about, we could actually start to look at one of our decisions is what price to test next. So that's the problem we were looking at with this sort of small firm, um, was, you know, let's start at $30 and then adjust down and up until we figure out what the you know, the shape of the demand curve is. What the elasticity is. Yeah, that's, yeah, fascinating. Um, all right, I, I see some folks typing some questions in the TLC calls. Keep keep getting your questions there. I will ask them as they come across. Um, Ellie, I wanted to ask you, so the, the data that you all um, were able to get access to, um, ironically, you know, you mentioned, we have the data, we're squirreling it away. Um, it's not always true. Uh, in my experience, 
the vast majority of our clients, unless they have some sort of uh, uh, learning library or a platform that stores all their data. And even in those cases, oftentimes the, the data is stuck in like a PowerPoint deck or a slide deck, and it's not mm. in a nice, neat, um, you know, everybody, all the data is the same. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned is that you looked at uh, next page click through rate so that you, because everybody had that data. Well, that's also not always the case. Um, right. Some tests right. are revenue based, some tests are this, and they, they only pull certain metrics. So all the data is different. So do you have any advice for um, you, uh, the data format that you would recommend people maybe start capturing and collecting and storing the data so that they can do? Oh, the, yeah, that's the, a good, good question. So I, for every single test, I would want to know, you know, what some record of what were the treatments that were actually tested and you know, where on the website, or was this an email, you know, what kind of test it was. Um, and then just what was the response in each group? You don't need like the raw data, but like the summarized data. So the mean and the variance, or in the case of conversion, you just need the conversion rate um, for the two, two or however many treatments that you had. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. You know who has this squirreled away? The email marketers do because their tool just has the their perfect records of it. That's how I got um, started. I remember that data it was so rich. It was so easy to, <laughs> to make decisions. And then direct marketing has the data too. Um, right. It did a lot of that, but. Uh, and some big firms that. have nice, like, um, so the group at Microsoft that's doing tests on like on software, like Bing tests yeah. will have a huge, they have like a, a system where everything gets archived and it can get read in there. Um, and just to bring up some of the criticism of kind of this point, my point of view on this, um, I've been criticized by some of those folks uh, who point out that when you have that good repository, other people are going to read the repository and assume that that is going to be true in their situation as well. So you do need a bigger sample. If you're going to do that, this, this only works when you're only going to use the information for this test. Cause the, the way I've set up the math, I'm maximizing the profit, assuming we will never use that learning for another reason. If you're going to use the learning for another reason, then it needs to be more precise and you would need a bigger test. Um, so for so, example, if you were testing, uh, on, let's say you had a, a global company that had multiple brands or multiple regions, and you ran a test in a small segment, you can't assume, uh, without higher error control or something or rep, uh, repeatability that what you learned here. Works right. In all right. Those other exactly. That, brands. that, that, so the, in the fancy name for this in science is the extensibility or generalizability of the findings. Right. Um, and there's, you know, that's something to worry about that we're not worrying about here. But if that's, that's if that's, that's also your plan true with your multi-arm bandits, your Thompson sampling, you know, they, they're also not generalizable. Definitely. They're actually even worse in a way, <laughs> um, because they kind of like, they actually create a confound in the data that makes it hard to analyze. There's a bunch of researchers who are actually working on like, how should we, and if we want to take generalizable results from a bandit how should we analyze the data? And um, that's not a trivial problem. Um, so it, yeah, another potentially downside of bandits. So in the ultimate ironies, as we were having the, this just now discussion, Dylan asked the question that you just answered. So I wanted you to know he did ask the question and he was like, and there's the answer. So, you know, the question he asked was for new features or business strategies that have large organizational implications if they win, don't seem like great places for this method because the focus is on rolling and not learning. Is that the takeaway? And then he's like, and there's the answer. If you want to- Yes, definitely. Area, that is- Not a great method. Dylan is spot on right that you wouldn't want to do it in a situation where they're, yeah, where you're going to try to use the learn. Like you're going to say, okay, we're doing this master test to find out if we for all time should use female heroes or male heroes. That's looking for a generalizable finding that wouldn't, so this wouldn't be appropriate and you'd want to use a larger sample size. Right. And sure. like we always say, start with the problem you're trying to, to answer and pick the best method for getting that answer. And this had, is a, yeah. a new tool in the toolbox, which I love. I had a random, um, Random thing I also wanted to tell you. So there's a there's yeah. a related paper 
uh, from a, a group at Penn that was working with the Microsoft uh, a a archive of tests from the Microsoft data. Mm -hmm. And they actually found a funny thing about those tests, which is that they are what's called fat tailed. So most of the Microsoft tests show no lift, but occasionally you just get like the golden ticket just shows up right. and it really lifts things a lot. And that's a function of what Microsoft has chosen to test. Um, but assuming that that continues, uh, he actually shows that if that's the case, the sample sizes get even smaller because all you're doing is looking for the golden ticket. You don't really care about, you know, if your goal is to like run a whole bunch of super innovative ideas and then pick one or two to implement, uh, which is what Microsoft is doing. Um, so most of their tests are clunkers with a few things that are outstanding then you can run teeny, teeny, tiny tests. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm not the only person who's saying like, hey, maybe we could run smaller tests. Uh, he, you know, uh, the papers by um, Eduardo Alzevedo is the first author on the paper. And I was like, like, you know, you're, you think you're getting pushback. I'm getting even more pushback because I'm saying it could be even, even smaller. <laughs> so. Well, it's super helpful. I mean, a lot of our clients have data that's or sample sizes that are so small they feel that they can't do experimentation at all. So this gives them an even better way, um, or or at least a potential way, of adding a little bit more science to their decision making. So, yeah, exactly. I think it, that is the perfect case for it. Is when you have a client who who does this formula. Let me flip ahead in the slides. Um, a person who, whoa, well, I can't. I can't work my computer anymore. Sorry. I'm just going to stop sharing because that was embarrassing. Um, so uh, if you have a client who uses a traditional sample size calculator and it says like 10,000 and they're like, my traffic isn't that high. I can't do that. This right. is the perfect thing. Like you can still actually increase your profits Absolutely. if you run the smaller tests. And even if you don't use the formula, that learning is still true. If you use it for your immediate decision-making, I mean, intuitively, wouldn't you rather make so a decision based on too little data, like too little a, data than zero data? Like a little data has got to be more than nothing. Better than nothing. Better than being blindfolded and throwing darts. Um, uh, Dylan says sample sizes get smaller with larger MDEs, of course, uh, in the normal calculation already, which is true. So bigger, mm -hmm. you need less data. Um, and he said, so I don't, I'm not sure that this is a surprising thing. I think the thing that was surprising to me about your formula was the uh, adjustment of your sample size based on the population size. So larger needs yeah, more. Yeah, but let me, less. let me get back to Dylan. So the, yeah. one of the interesting differences between the two formulas, this might get super technical, but that minimal detectable event is a point thing. And what I'm saying is, well, there's a whole range of things that could happen. And I actually don't care if I make mistakes when A and B are very similar. I don't care if I make a mistake. Um, uh, Matt Gershoff has talked a little bit about in yeah. some contexts, a type one error doesn't matter. Do if A and B so are exactly the same and I deploy the wrong one, it who doesn't cares? Matter. Didn't matter. Yeah. Um, and so in this approach, we're actually saying, well, there's a whole range of things that could happen. And what we want to do is catch the big, the ones that are big enough to matter and ignore the one, the differences that are small enough not to matter. And to do that in a systematic way where you're actually thinking about profit. Uh, so that is one sort of technical difference is that minimal detectable effect. Like if you're looking for bigger things, yeah, the sample size is going to be smaller, but what it doesn't allow you to do that we can do is make that trade off between like, well, how, what, you know, how small is a fish that's too small to keep yep. or too small to try to catch, I guess is the best way to say it. Which is one of the hardest questions that, you know, we always ask how big of a lift do you need to see to make a decision? I don't know, as long as it's better, ah, that gets you nowhere. It's a zero cycle. Um, Merit asks, and this will be our last question because we only have one minute left. Um, does this formula apply the same to both binomial and continuous metrics? 
So uh, technically the answer is no, you'll be interested in the appendix in the paper. So actually the reviewers asked us that question. Um, and it turns out like the, the continuous formula can approximate the binomial for large samples, right? Then the binomial eventually becomes a normal asymptotically, fancy words. Um, so if you have a big sample size, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, but if you have a smaller sample size, it does matter. And actually, uh, so we have in the appendix and in the code that's on GitHub, if you want to see the code, um, we have a function that does it specifically for the binomial case. And then in the appendix of the paper, there's a, a table that compares the two. And it basically only doesn't matter so long as you're above, like, it was a couple thousand. If you're below a couple thousand, then you do want to check out the appendix. All right, Ellie, thank you so much. Um, with your permission, I'll send out the PDF of your presentation today. Sure. Um, and Enrique did ask is where your paper is published and if it's open access. It is not open access, but if you go to my GitHub, there's replication code and I snuck a copy of the paper in there too. <laughs> you didn't hear it here and it doesn't live on YouTube. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Ellie. I really appreciate it as always. Great job making complex ideas easier for everybody to understand. Um, I'll uh, and Merritt has already uh, um, shared your uh, link to the paper. So thank you again. And uh, recording will be posted probably later today. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye, all. <laughs>